Certain areas within physics still present mysteries that we have only just begun to speculate about. One of these is the concept, or concepts, of exotic matter. Matter not as we know it, and matter that may have properties very much unlike normal matter. An example of this would be a hypothesized type of exotic matter that would have negative mass, and thus would be repelled by gravity instead of attracted by it. There are other forms of exotic matter, and they all depend on one thing. They do not violate the laws of physics. In other words, they aren't prohibited from existing. But that doesn't mean that they exist or can be made, only that they are, at a basic level, allowed. Though such forms of matter are highly unlikely, they might still be possible. In addition to extensive modeling of the first discovered interstellar object, Oumuamua, which continues to present mysteries that warrant a look at more exotic explanations, my guest today has suggested in a recent paper that maybe, though highly unlikely, Oumuamua's strange acceleration might have involved some form of exotic matter. Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Sergei Machenko. Dr. Machenko is a senior research associate in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at McMaster University. He is a computational astrophysicist with interests in small scale problems of the standard cosmology, origin of dwarf galaxies and globular clusters, interstellar medium physics, and dynamics of minor celestial bodies. His paper, Modeling the Light Curve of Oumuamua, Evidence for talk and disc-like shape is the result of a year of work to understand the possible shape of the first interstellar visitor, Oumuamua. Sergei Maschenko, welcome to the program. Oh, hi. What initially drew you to look into the first known interstellar object, Oumuamua? Yes, in fact, it's probably an interesting point because I don't think I emphasize it anyway in my paper. But it was a very simple idea very simple geometric idea. The very first observations showed huge brightness variations of this object. And one of the earlier papers were suggesting extreme cigar-like shape. And it struck me instantly, just very unlikely, just simple geometry. You know, cigar, you have to point at the observer almost precisely to produce such a huge brightness variation. So I quickly made uh, back of the envelope calculations, very simple model. And even if you use something as thin as needle, still the basic probability of pointing so precisely at the observer was very small, just a few percent. So that uh, was the motivation. Uh, plus, of course, it, the object is very enigmatic, so it's boosted my interest. And then that started my modeling efforts, which became more and more involved as we realized it's actually much more complicated than it was thought initially. Complicated is sort of the word for this because there that huge brightness variation. So what are some of the other options? I remember one thing that was on the table was a pancake shape, which certainly makes one wonder after seeing Ultima Thule that, you know, maybe objects like that tend to be flat. What, uh, what, what does that look like? Alternative explanation? Yes. Uh, yes, indeed. I, I thought instantly disk must be the something very disky. If you stick to geometric interpretation, and I understand geometric explanation is just preferred option for people doing research in uh, minor bodies, because everything we've seen out there, if we see some large brightness variations, we, and then we can somehow see the shape, either spacecraft or some other means, you know, radars, it's always mostly shape driven. So albedo, which is change of brightness, reflectivity, is much less of an effector. Uh, so, uh, di sorry, disk was uh, one possibility, but of course, uh, al extreme albedo change was early, considered early enough in early papers, but was ruled out for perhaps not 100% bulletproof reasons. 
this change in albedo, could this be sort of, rather than it being a shape creating this, could it simply be that the object has bright and dark spots all over its surface that make the effect, or is, has that been ruled out? Uh, well, I'm most familiar with my own research results, of course, and I did consider in my paper, one of my models is the one I call black and white ball. So it's effectively a roughly spherical object where the primary agent of extreme brightness variation is a very different albedos of two hemispheres. And my model were obtained pretty nice fit to the brightness light, light curves of the object, but it requires by a factor of 30 or more difference in reflectivity of the two sides, which is unheard of in solar system objects, but, you know, nothing unheard of maybe for an interstellar object yeah yeah for this very strange object so nothing should be real, ruled out basically at this point unfortunately there's no way to really verify that now is there Mumu is on its way out it's been yeah since january of last year so it's been more than a year non-observable technically still within solar system so as technology improves we might just fly there and check it out in maybe five ten years who knows with any luck now one thing that I noticed in your paper is torque. Yep. And that this 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 would tend to suggest that the object is outgassing, even though that wasn't actually observed. It it still seems to be. Can you tell us about that? Yes, it's a good point. Uh, people commenting on my paper usually overlooks this point, but this is one of the two I believe interesting result outcomes of my paper. Uh, indeed, uh, my results seem to quite firmly suggests that an inertial model, which means a model where nothing is affecting internally or maybe externally, there was no forces behind or beyond gravity, seems to be ruled out. So you need something which affects rotational state of the object. Not necessarily outgassing. I try to be sort of democratic in my paper and I'm not ruling out anything. For example, the solar sail, you know, very exotic idea uh, can still be valid in my model context if parts of the sail have slightly different albedo. So the difference in solar pressure would actually create enough of, enough of torque to create uh, the things I observe in my uh, in, in lightness, in, sorry, in light curve. Now with the light sail option, um, which obviously is unlikely, but everything has to be on the table, so that you're saying that it would have to have different reflectivity across its surface, or could it be tumbling? Okay, so let me clear things up. Uh, tumbling has to be present. So what we call tumbling is the fact that this object rotates in a non-simple way. So usually objects, they rotate either around largest or smallest axis. Let's say if it's tracks so or ellipsoid, ellipsoid would rotate around one of the two. If it's not the case, then it's kind of uh, much more complicated rotation, and we call it non-principal axis or tumbling. And tumbling can still be inertial, but if you apply a torque to even something which rotates simply initially, it would become tumbling, almost guaranteed, because you apply force and you push it away from simple rotation. So anything generated torque, either outgassing or perhaps uh, radiation uh, fr from non-uniform albedo would make uh, object tumbling. So if it were a solar sail, that would suggest that it, it's a dead solar sail. <laughs> it, it, it must be because judging from how strongly and frequently the brightness changes, solar sail is meant to point in certain direction uh, on the, basically to benefit from a sun, from the star light. And if it's changing so significantly, which means it's out of order, obviously, it's a spinning. Now back to the other models, what do you think is the most likely one, the pancake? In terms of uh, simplest geometry, it's, I don't have doubts. It must be something more like a, a pancake or slab. Because as I said, uh, even simplest back of the envelope estimates tells you this is very unlikely. This huge more than factor of 10 brightness variation requires you to be within just a few degrees, angular degrees from this uh, axis pointing at you. So the, the rest of my paper followed basically trying to quantify this back of the envelope stuff. So initially I thought my paper will be just 
one page, two pages, maybe not even worth publishing. And then I realized this object's not a simple rotator, it's tumbling. And when I completely built my tumbling model, I realized it's still not enough. So actually, you have to add some torque, which makes quite a bit more complicated modeling. So the complexity really grew, but I finally reached the point where I could model nicely the light curve using some physical, plausible object, a cigar or this, and then I can actually compute precisely the probabilities, one versus the other one. So that's how at the paper, which was meant to be two pages, ended up being, I don't know, 20, 21 pages. This sounds like a project that expanded outside of what you initially thought it was. So how long did it take? So I was working for more than a year. So initial idea took me hours, basically, to write it down, calculate, but to prove my initial idea, I spent another year basically developing from scratch new computational code, which runs on a GPU. So CUDA programming is one of my specialties. It's sort of one of the reasons I, I was well positioned to tackle this problem. And also I had recent experience in a very complex multidimensional optimization. And this is another sort of strength one needs to try to feed complex light curve with complex multi-parameter models. Now, I remember during um, during the period when Umuamo was being studied heavily, that it appeared to be reddened. Now, does that play into this albedo question? Oh, I've seen some statements portraying slightly different. I think more consensus opinion I read more recently, it is not redder than any other object out there. So it has quite typical covers, which are slightly redder than, uh, I don't know, something maybe on the Earth, but totally common for space objects. And uh, in terms of albedo, the fact that cover didn't seem to change much, there was some, not very direct, but there was some evidence that seems to suggest that extreme albedo variations are unlikely to be the main source of huge brightness variation because it's it would be very strange to have 30 times difference in brightness or reflectivity of two hemispheres and have almost the same color it's i just can't imagine that happening now about these about these geometries specifically the disk now how long and thin would the object have to be in order to fit that model okay i have to be statistically sound here a referee of my paper actually was expert in estimation, not just give me the answer, give me also distribution of all the potential ranges of your answer. So uh, technically, it could be as low as little as one to three ratio for either cigar or this. But the most likely values I found, they're more like one to six, one to seven ratio. And they're comparable for the cigar-like and disc-like shapes. I see. So similar for both. Now, in the, in the, in the light sail model, I mean, how big would this have to be to fit what was seen? So, in fact, uh, one of the alternative models I considered in my paper was the light cell, effectively. What I call light cell was basically my disk uh, uh, collapsed to almost zero thickness. And I could actually fit reasonably well, not as well as with my normal disk, which had, you know, aspect ratio one to seven or so. But we, uh, there are some actual degeneracies in my model, which means it can be arbitrarily thin and still be almost behaving in the same way as other th just regularly thin models. And in fact, that would make somewhat compatible to what was suggested as a solar sail with extremely low surface density. It was, and thickness I think was like half a millimeter. So it would be still consistent. It's not as good fit as thicker disc, which is the best fitting model in my paper. Uh, but no, it's uh, still within the sort of realm of uh, possibilities from my perspective, fitting the light curve of the object. Do you have a gut feeling on what we're actually seeing or what we <laughs> saw with, with Umumo? Do you think this might have been something like an exhausted comet or something like that that was just outgassing a little bit, producing some torque, but fundamentally it was pretty well dead? I was uh, actually, this interview sort of reignited my interest. I went and read the most recent papers published after my paper. 
And uh, there are some interesting results out there, but still, I think uh, it is very, very unusual. It's very hard to come up with a single picture explaining different aspects. So you see this non-gravitational acceleration detected, uh, sorry, names, uh, Michelli, I think, and her group. And the this is the linear company at non-gravitational acceleration. And then my paper, which seems to suggest there is a torque, which another manifestation of some kind of force applied to the object. And so this all suggests it's more a like comet, right? But the, even the most recent paper I was checking seems to be bringing even more sort of puzzling uh, results that outgazing is ruled out at a higher and higher degree. So it, it's a still big puzzle what exactly it is. Maybe it's interstellar dust bunny. It's, I mean, it's, it's a possibility. This was suggested not long time ago. Uh, but I'm not sure you can imagine this thing spinning the way it was spinning and having the shape it had, uh, judging from my model. So it's still very enigmatic object. And honestly, I don't have a clue what it is. <laughs> no, it's interesting that you, you mentioned the interstellar dust bunny or the, I believe that was a, a fractal, I think it is what, what it was termed. Yes, one of the paper was, yeah, talking about. In which case is an interesting possibility of a, a natural light sail. Uh, yeah, indeed. I mean, it would be extremely exotic, nothing we've seen ever, but trying to pick from impossible to, you know, implausible. So maybe you should pick one of these. Uh, highly unlikely, but perhaps uh, possible uh, explanation. If I may, the reason why only one paragraph in my paper, I brought up another crazy idea of my own. Because one other way to try to explain why there was non-gravitational acceleration is to assume this was a piece of exotic matter where the gravity law is slightly different from the conventional form. So I estimated that if gravity constant G would be only basically eight ten thousandth fraction less than the nominal value, then it would appear it has this non-gravitational acceleration, where in fact it would just have plain old gravity. And the interesting thing about it, uh, there would be no torque by design. If it's not a real force, it's just a fake, it's actually slightly different gravity, which uh, manifests itself as a fake force directed away from the science, uh, which scales as inverse square of the distance, exactly what was discovered. But well, what it is, is just different slightly different uh, gravity constant, by design would have zero torque because it's not a real force. So some papers were suggested that uh, a torque would destroy the object. Uh, there were papers by um, Rafikov, who suggest basically, if you assume it a uh, non-linear non gravitational, sorry, non-gravitational acceleration is as de detected, it should have resulted in a torque which would just break apart the object. Uh, which is a, a, an interesting valid point, even though in my paper I sort of estimate torque not as extreme, but I only cover five days of observations, right? Uh, but before it traveled through inner solar system, if there was a torque even stronger perhaps earlier, so there was a puzzle. How can you have so much non-gravitational linear acceleration and not falling apart? So my paragraph, which is just a side comment inside my paper suggests maybe exotic matter with slightly different gravity law would do the trick. All options must be on the table. Now, exotic matter, there are a few postulated forms of this, such as, um, well, there's, uh, you know, negative mass and things like that. Is that sort of what you're getting towards? Or is this could just simply be something we don't know anything about yet and nobody's thought of? Is there any form of exotic matter that's that's hypothesized that might fit this? So there was actually one one of the earliest paper and Umamoa was the one suggesting it is made out of exotic, I believe, strange matter. But with that interpretation, the object would have to be extremely massive. I believe mass comparable to mass of Earth or something like that. Very small, but super dense. And that paper said we would follow up with observation of or orbits of planets in the next year to see if they were perturbed. As there was no follow up, so I presume it wasn't. So it's probably not strange matter. But thinking even 
maybe antimat. I mean, it's not that exotic, but I looked it up. I'm not expert, but I looked it up. There is no experimental measurement of gravity force for antimatter to the, you know, 1000%, maybe that's the accuracy of G. Basically, it wasn't measured. Uh, it's just there is not enough antimatter to actually measure gravity constant G. So it does have to be super exotic to to potentially produce this effect. We just don't have measurements for anything beyond regular matter for gravity constant. Now, some people have in the past suggested that, and again, you're right, this has never been measured, but that antimatter could actually be anti-gravity in some way. But my question would be, how would an antimatter object survive being, you know, going through the interstellar medium hitting hydrogen <laughs> for yeah, enough time? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I just give you an as example. Even passing through solar inner solar system, there is zodiac, uh, you know, particles and so on, would be probably glowing. And, uh, you know, I, I never actually tried to estimate that. But just give you an idea. So there are possibilities. Anything beyond normal matter would not have the gravity constant measured. So uh, I'm not expert. Uh, I'm just upfront telling you in uh, this kind of physics, but uh, just uh, the fact remains a tiny change in gravity constant would exactly reproduce the effect, the how it depends on the distance from the sun direction, and the fact apparently no powerful torque was exerted, so it, it would fit the bill. Isn't it? That's very interesting, especially since the object is that strange that that it's it's worth looking at at sort of the frontiers, the fringes of physics, you know, physics, new physics, maybe that um, it was that strange to sort of get into that territory um, and light sails for that matter, artificial light sails and other things that have been mentioned. Exactly. So in fact, I'm pretty happy that uh, the second interstellar object, which was discovered recently, uh, the comet Borisov, was plain boring. <laughs> it actually, it helped to emphasize the contrast of the first one, which was totally unexpected. So the Umamua was meant, was supposed to be Borisov. It was the very first interstellar object was expected to be just plain comet without any special features. And that's the second object Borisov happened to be. Normal comet behaves almost exactly as by the book, and that made the very first object, interstellar objects, even stranger because it's definitely not a normal comet in any way. Now it's interesting. I noticed too that you, you're absolutely right. Borisov is a is a, a comet. <laughs> it may be interstellar, but other than that, it's it looks just like a solar system comet. Oumuamua looks very different, but it also seems conspicuous to me that. We have been watching and calculating comet orbits since Edmund Halley, you know, 300 yeah. years. And we have yet to see an obvious, you know, comet that was on a hyperbolic trajectory that was not bound to the sun. Yet all of a sudden we see Oumuamua and then we see Borisov. And it, it just seems to me that we, we should have seen this before, you know, because as I, as I said, we've been watching comet orbits for hundreds of years. Is it possible that objects like Oumuamua never had a cometary origin? Maybe it's a, you know, I, I, some people have said it's like a sh maybe it's a shard from a, a planet that was shattered or something like that. Something a little bit rarer, but it seems to me statistically weird that we would actually spot that as the first one. The first object would end up being so strange. What can we learn now? Is there anything else that you expect that we can figure out without actually going out there about the nature of Oumuamua? Can we maybe infer from your work what this thing was made of or, you know, what its density was, things like that? Can we infer that from these models? Just as an example, we still can discover new things based on non-detections. Just the paper I was just referring to you by Hui and Knight, New Insights into Interstellar Object, published uh, or submitted in October of last year. And basically they used the fact that the object wasn't detected by solar observing satellites. Actually gives very interesting information about very interesting limits, how much water it could have, evaporated, you know, outgassing and things like that. So we still can continue to discover things of just going back into archival data 
and do, do either find a non-detection or who knows, we might find a detection, overlook detection, some other uh, observational survey. But going back to your point about what we can draw from the fact that we saw two things in a row, they're, they're totally different, right? So Umamo is one of its own. Uh, it's really not, doesn't look like it's part of Norman normal cometary type of objects, and Borisov is more like a comet. It's hard to draw much conclusion from a single appearance uh, of an object. So I know there have been papers trying to de-estimate uh, origins based on frequencies, the fact that we discovered one, like Kumaomua. So it's, yeah, there is huge uncertainty there. But the fact that we discovered Umaomo when we did it, uh, it's not very surprising. So we had this new survey, which actually was probably the first survey capable of discovering this object. The problem with Umaomo is extremely small and it moves super fast. It's hyperbolic, it moves very fast across the sky. Uh, and it's extremely faint. So you needed very special kind of telescope and survey to actually see it. So, and uh, my understanding is it was discovered shortly after this survey became sort of fully operational. So maybe it's it's not sur sur that surprising that it was discovered when indeed it was discovered. It could be said we are entering the age of the discovery of interstellar objects because we have pan stars that can see these things, but we also have things coming like the LSST, the Large Synaptic Survey Telescope, that will give us an almost real-time view of the heavens, and we will be able to spot presumably all sorts of interstellar objects if they are indeed as common as they appear to be from our two data points here. So ultimately, if we keep detecting these and they all look like Borisov and say we have 30 interstellar objects that we know of and they all look like Borisov except Oumuamua. What territory do we head into then? Do we really have to seriously consider that it may have been some sort of flotsam from an alien civilization? <laughs> uh, well, scientists typically are very reluctant to move in that territory. They try to stick to physically plausible sort of natural explanation. I would rule it out. Just purely my personal opinion, it's unlikely. It's not a natural object. Uh, but it is extremely unusual, very interesting object. I would love uh, something like that to be discovered again, so we can actually study better. Or perhaps a space mission one day go in there and telling us what, what it was, what it is. Uh, because it is very strange object and it may tell us a great deal new things about universe. And if nothing else, it shows us, it would show us what, what objects from presumably could be across the entire galaxy or wherever its origins were, what they're like. And we can say, okay, well, Borisov looks like our star system, material from our star system, but Mumu doesn't. It, it was from somewhere else. What environment did it come from? You know, so there are a lot, there's a lot to learn, and I think the most exciting thing is that we now have samples of objects from other areas of the galaxy that we can study. Exactly. So I'm I'm actually very happy Umamua happened because if all we had Borisov and Simova, yeah, it would be exciting, but not probably as exciting uh, as it is otherwise. So there are, there are things out there which don't necessarily fit our established theories. And it, this is great. It sort of expands our horizons and drives us to go out there to try harder, find similar objects, and perhaps learn totally new physics, new, 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 uh, getting new knowledge about the universe around us. Indeed, and it only seems to get more interesting and exciting as we get more and more instruments and in study. Doctor, we are out of time. I appreciate you uh, appearing with us today. My pleasure. Objects like Oumuamua serve to remind us that our understanding of science is not yet complete, far from it, and there are many dark areas that are not yet fully explored, and even areas we may never understand, such as the interior of black holes or what caused the Big Bang. Indeed, I think we are poised for new discoveries in science over the next few decades that will completely remake our place in the universe. I, for one, can't wait. John, where is the Opossum? Last I saw, he was in the backyard doing something. Not sure what. Oh, really? What is that stack of carrots doing in the kitchen? He's building something. Like a satellite dish. A satellite dish out of vegetables? 
Yeah, a vegetable dish. A vegetable dish. Really? How long did it take for the two of you to come up with that one? 